Hello again. Hello again. Uh, sometimes it takes a bit for this video to get started. I'm using YouTube Alive. I share it only to myself, make some edits, and then I upload it uh, to the channel. So uh, yesterday I did a, uh, a video talking about uh, stall spin awareness in the uh, Transport Canada Stall Spin Awareness Guide. And uh, that was fun for me. And I hope that those of you who have watched it or parts of it got something out of it. And uh, today, I want to talk about um, something that uh, perhaps is not really emphasized enough, is the walk-around, the pre-flight walk-around, or the inspection of the aircraft. I have uh, on my computer here a Cessna 172N, as in November model, uh, Pilot Operating Handbook, or POH, which I'll use as a reference. Um, for this talk, uh, but I'd like to just sort of generally discuss the walk around and how one might approach it. There's more than one way to skin that cat. Um, I've watched a lot of students uh, do walk arounds over the years, and um, often I'd have to say, I'd have to say they're either uh, uh, too fast, too incomplete or focus often on the less consequential things and uh, some of the more consequential aspects of the walk around are lightly uh, inspected. So um, like I say, there's more than one way to do a walk around. And uh, however, in the pilot operating handbook of every aircraft, there's usually a section which describes the walk around um, as a checklist form. And uh, that's a good start for anybody who hasn't had a good demonstration from an instructor or for another, from another pilot to use the uh, walk around checklist from the pilot operating handbook. So um, uh, although I do have on the computer here a Cessna 172 and the model uh, POH, um, I can mostly do this from my head. So I'll, I'll just tell you how I approach a walk around and uh, how I demonstrate a walk around to, uh, to my students uh, on their first day. Um, so first of all, um, as you walk to the airplane, you should be already working. Um, you've got a big picture view of the airplane as you approach it from the side, from the front, or from the rear. Um, and that's a good chance to perhaps do a large circle around the aircraft where you can see the whole airplane in your view as you go around the aircraft. And you can discern quite a few things from that. For example, if there's a crumplage in the empennage or the fuselage, if there has been a ding in the wingtip or uh, along the wing, um, if there are obviously broken navigation lights or beacons or strobes, you can see that. If there's a flat tire, of course, you can discern that in the big walk around. So I usually will do one large circle around the aircraft. You may see fluid leakage from the brakes, the brake lines, or um, perhaps oil um, or fuel on the ground in this large walk around. So just do a turn around the airplane clockwise or counterclockwise. Some people do that in the beginning, some people do that at the end, and some people do it two times, once at the beginning and once at the end. Um, and then, of course, the very first thing you need to do, because you need to retract the flaps, of course, or sorry, extend the flaps in order to inspect the flaps, the hinges and the uh, tracks for the flaps, is, of course, you go to the uh, pilot uh, captain side of the aircraft on the left hand side and uh, open the door. Now, the fir very first thing that I check when I open the door is uh, the fire bottle or the fire extinguisher. Now, some flight schools have a lot of airplanes and the fire, fire extinguishers are in different spots in the airplane. I remember at Harv's Air, there's one particular airplane where I couldn't find the fire extinguisher. That's because it was up underneath the dashboard on the co-pilot side. So uh, that's a great opportunity to refresh your memory as to where the uh, fire extinguisher is. And then to check it for two things. Can anybody guess what those two things are? I'll give you five seconds. Two, three. Okay, yeah, so is it full? Is the needle in the green? Is it empty? That's a big thing. 
Um, and of course, is it securely attached? And that's very important as well. Also, you can check the tag that's attached to it to see that if it's expired and is due to be recharged. So there's three things actually that you can check with the fire bottle. Quick look around the, the cabin, look for anything obviously broken or missing. And then uh, having done that, um, one can take the control lock out of the control column, maybe put it in the front left pocket there and uh, flip on the master switch and see if the electrics are working properly. Hear the uh, turn coordinator gyro spinning up. And uh, as if you're going on a night flight or even if you're not, it's a great opportunity to first uh, extend the flaps. And before you switch it off, just quickly go and look and see whether the red light and the green light and the beacon and or the strobes, or if you're doing a night flight, or even if you're not, the, the uh, what I call the headlamp, but the landing lamp or landing and taxi lamps function. Um, of course, you want to turn that master switch off after you've had that look to conserve the battery. And that's, and, uh, that's basically the inside. And of course, check the fuel levels and the fuel needles, although Cessnas are notoriously unreliable with regards to fuel quantity indicators. Um, however, other aircraft uh, have better fuel, quantity, fuel quantity indicators or needles. Um, it's at that point that I would grab the uh, dipstick for the tanks and the filter device to, to strain the fuel. And uh, the flaps are now extended, the master switch is off, and we can begin with the exterior inspection. Now for me, I start exactly uh, where, where the door is to the pilot side. So the very first thing to check is the static port, which is just in front of the door on the left-hand side of the airplane. And I check to see that it's not plugged. It's perhaps, say, a bug or um, some sort of uh, detritus. Um, if it's winter time, it might might be snow or frost in it and make sure it's clear. It's just a tiny, tiny, tiny little hole. Um, so have a good look at it. Make sure it's not plugged up. At that point, um, usually what I will do is I will, because it's connected to the pedostatic system, is I will go to the pedo tube, which of course is on the left wing and the Cessnas, and make sure that it's in good shape. And of course, there's several things to look at. I look at three things. Is it, is it attached firmly? Is it loose? to make sure that the front end of the pitot tube, the hole is clear of obstructions. And then there's a drain port in the back and it's just a needle hole in the back at the elbow of the pitot tube. And that's a, that's a, a moisture drain. Make sure that that's a, not obstructed. And because it's right beside that, you have this little tube that kind of looks like a pitot, pitot tube. It's just a little tube that's bent and that's the fuel vent. And it's a very good idea to check that the fuel vent is not obstructed um, for obvious reasons. You want the fuel to flow, it's a gravity feed system, through to the carburetor without any impediment. And another hole that's important to check that's close to these devices is the stall horn. Um, well, it's the stall horn entrance. So um, you can check to see if it's clear of obstructions and if you're brave in the summertime. You might just smack your lips up against that and suck hard. And of course, it will make the stall horn, uh, most times will make the stall horn or reed make that stall horn sound. Eep. So you can check those three things very quickly. Usually after I've done that, I go back to the strut and I look, I, I make sure that the door hinges are good because the door hinges are on the front of the door. Then I look at the strut and I look at the, at the, uh, I look at the hydraulic brake line down the strut and then I can inspect the wheel. When I inspect the wheel, the first thing I want to check is to see is that if the, if the rubber tire is in good condition, is it inflated enough? Um, if it's obviously low that you would see that. Um, are there any scuffs or, or scuff marks or cracks that could potentially cause a failure of the wheel of the, of the tire? So I would check that. And then of course, I want to make sure that the fastening bolt and the cotter pin that holds it in the wheel itself is in good condition and that the cotter pin is in locking the wheel bolt. And then of course, now you have the brakes and it's a disc style brake and you can see, you can see the disc, which is on the inside of the wheel. You want to see whether it's warped. Um, if it hasn't been flown for a while, you'll notice that it has surface rust on it. 
if it's been flown recently, it'll be polished, polished smooth. Pardon me, it's getting a little bit dark here. <clears throat> and then, of course, you want to see if there's any hydraulic fluid that is leaked out uh, onto the ground or onto the brake casing. So, um, and then of course there's the brake pads and the brake pads, just like a, a car disc brake pads should be adequately thick. They shouldn't be paper thin. Of course, then you could have a brake failure. So that's just looking at the brakes alone. As you can see, there's more than you might think. Um, at that point, usually what I do satisfied with that is I walk along the left wing and I literally just move my hand along the wing um, as I as I inspect it, and of course you're going to see any obvious dents. There's, now a lot of these older Cessnas are going to have tiny little dents and chips of paint flaked off, and this is normal, unless it's a newer or re repainted airplane. That's pretty normal, and that will take you to the wing tip, which is usually uh, a plastic or a plastic type material. Um, sometimes they're of different shapes um, at the end of the wing, and you're looking for cracking. You're looking for uh, screws that hold it on potentially missing um, yeah so you're just looking for general condition and now as you go to the back of the wing you have access to the aileron now a lot of people will just sort of hold the aileron and walk along but the ailerons held to the wing with um, by hinges and and those hinges have nuts and bolts so what I like to do is as I go along as I, I wiggle the aileron I'm looking to see if the other ailerons going in the opposite direction. This one's down, that one's up, that one's down, this one's up. Um, I'm, I'm trying to feel if there's any looseness in the play. I want to see that all 12, I think it's three times four bolts, three sets of hinges, three hinges with uh, three or four, I can't remember, screws each, uh, nuts and bolts each, are all fastened. And that the push rod for the aileron is properly fastened um, to the aileron and doesn't have too much play. Okay, so inspecting the aileron. I mean, with the thing about airplanes is it's held together often with hinges and cables, um, nuts and bolts, and you want to make sure that none of them have loosened up and fallen off. So I start with the aileron. Of course, so now that takes me to the flaps, the left-hand flap. Usually what I'll do is I'll move the flap up and down a little bit. There should only be a little bit of play in it. There will always be some play in it. It's not going to be perfectly... It's not going to, you're not going to be able to not move it. There's going to be a little, little bit of play in it. And that's normal. Then you'll see that there's, there's tracks. There are tracks on the left and right-hand side, upper and underneath. You want to see that those tracks, that, that the little wheels that retract and extend the flaps uh, race through. I call them races. And you want to make sure that they're free of obstructions. And, uh, of course, there's a push rod there as well. And so you want to make sure that it's properly attached it'll have a lock nut that that's on, okay? So that takes care, and then look at the top of the wing, okay? You're looking for, is the fuel cap on the left-hand wing properly there proper? Are there any dents or is there ice contamination in the wintertime or frost? You wanna look at that. Underneath the wing, there are access ports. If the airplane came just from an inspection, and it's happened to be an access port, just these little round holes with plates with screws, so that they can look inside with their flashlights or all reattached. So don't forget to look for those. Do not forget to look for those. While you're now at the wing root, if you like, you can take a fuel sample, okay? And if you're doing that, you might as well hop up on the strut. And, uh, and of course, with the fuel sample, just before I move on, you're looking for, of course, the blue color for the avgas. Um, 100 low lead is blue, unless you're using MoGas. Um, and you're looking for, you take an example about, oh, about three quarters of an inch, and you're looking for bubbles in there, any, any sort of silt or sediment, and you want to be able to hold it up to the light and see that it's clear and bubble free. Pour that back into the wing, and then you can dip, the, you can dip uh, into the uh, gas tank. You can dip the wing with your dipstick and take a measurement of how much fuel is in the wing. Make sure the cap's securely fastened and you've taken care of the left-hand wing. At that point, you can go along the fuselage. Don't forget to get down on your knees, look underneath, look for any potentially obvious damage, okay? If uh, there's antennas and, uh, you know, you have uh, the transponder antenna, 
and you will have ADF antennas. If you have an ADF equipped airplane, make sure that they're not loose or missing or hanging by a wire. So you can check all that out as you go along the empennage towards the, uh, the stabilizer, okay, the horizontal stabilizer. And uh, of course, now it's like a little wing, so you can do the same kind of action that you did with the left-hand wing. You can check the fore part of the stabilizer, looking for dents, any obvious damage, and of course, around to the elevator. And now you've got hinges on the outside part of the wing, okay? So I want to make sure that those hinges are good. Always check the hinges. Don't just flap the thing around and think everything's fine. Look and see if the bolt and the nut are attached properly, okay? As you get to the, to the inner part of the elevator, of course, that's where you have the cables. And in the center, you're going to have like a horn, and you're going to have an upper cable and the lower cable. And they're going to be lock-wired, okay? And you're looking to see whether the cables that go into the fuselage operated by the elevator are not frayed like hanging by one wire because they're twisted wires, right? That the lock wires are properly attached, that they're not rubbing against parts of the uh, fuselage or the empennage, okay? That they're in generally good condition, that the nut and bolt holding them to the elevator horn are properly attached and secured, okay? And, uh, and then you can look up along the rudder on the vertical stabilizer. Of course, you can inspect the vertical stabilizer as a whole. And then you check the series of hinges as you move it left and right. Look at the hinges, but no, uh, not bolts, not bolts. Okay, you want to check that. And of course, there's another horn that uh, is attached to cables that moves the rudder left and right. Again, check the condition of the cables and uh, check the nuts and bolts that they're attached to because these are your control surfaces. If there's a problem there. If there's wear and tear or, or breakage there, it can be a very crucial thing. So don't just look and see whether the, the rudder and the elevator can move. Of course, you want to make sure they do move freely and there's no rubbing of cables against metal. But you want to see that the, that the connecting points are in good condition and properly fastened. Okay, as you continue along the elevator inside to out, again, you're checking the nuts and the bolts. So don't just move the control surfaces, inspect them. As you come around now, the right-hand side of the airplane, you move along the empennage, you can check that, checking the inspection plates, checking for any obvious damage. Now you're at the right-hand wing and you're at the, uh, the, flaps, uh, the flap of the right-hand wing. So repeat the action that I talked about for the left-hand wing. Check the races or tracks, check the actuator, check the, uh, 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 the actuator arm, um, and also check it for looseness. Um, and then inspect the, inspect the right-hand aileron in the same fashion you did the left-hand aileron. Upper, all the, all the bolts, lower, all the nuts are attached, and the actuator arm. Okay, you're not going to see any cables in this part. You're just going to see the actuator arms. Look underneath the wing for inspection plates that might have been not put back on or any obvious damage. Come around to the right-hand side, the outer, outer uh, side of the right wing, and check the wing tip, make sure that it's not damaged. Come back around, now you're in the front of the wing, on your hand along it, you're going towards the, the fuselage of the airplane, and that takes you right to the spot where you can take a fuel sample from underneath the wing, okay? Inspect the fuel, hop up, open up the fuel cap for the right hand wing, pour that if it's good, the fuel's good, pour it into the wing, don't just throw it on the ground, grab your dipstick and dip that tank and remember the amount. Okay, so now, so what you've done is you inspected most of the outside of the airplane and you've done a fuel inspection and you've done a fuel quantity check at this point. Now, while you're up there, you can look at the upper antennas, the VOR antennas, the GPS antenna, um, and, the, and, and perhaps the ADF sensing antenna if it's along there. And uh, just over an overall view of the top of the airplane. All right, so usually after I've done that, I come back down. Now I'm sitting in front of the right-hand wing strut and I repeat the action. Um, looking uh, from the wheel strut, lo looking for the uh, brake line, checking the wheel, how it's fastened, the tire condition, the brakes, pads, and, uh, and, and the rotor, and looking for any, any, any liquid or any hydraulic fluid that might be leaking from the right-hand right -hand brake. So all that's done now, and you're now standing right in front of the access plate to the motor. 
And what you can do is you can open that up and you can actually strain fuel from the fuel bowl, which is connected to the carburetor. So if there's any water that's built up there, any moisture that's built up there, of course, that would spill onto the ground. If you can reach underneath, you can take the fuel strainer. You can take the fuel strainer underneath the, the nose of the, of the airplane, and there'll be a little tube that comes out. And when you pull the fuel strainer inside the access port, the little lever, pull it, it'll fill up your strainer and you can inspect that. You may find sometimes there is some moisture uh, that comes out of that spot. So three straining points, at least on most airplanes, left hand wing, right hand wing, and the uh, fuel bowl strainer. Some airplanes have even more straining points. Like there's one airplane at Harv's Air that had, I think, 12, a ridiculous amount. Uh, at that point, um, you now have the engine access port open. You can unscrew the oil dipstick and have a hand rag, a, a, a rag handy, a hand raggy, have a rag handy and uh, wipe off the oil, put it back in, pull it out and do an oil quantity check. Now different airplanes require different minimum and maximum amounts of oil. Check the POH for your airplane, make sure that it has the right amount of oil. At that point, you can even inspect the quality of the oil. Is it really black? Which means that the airplane may be due for an oil change or is it very clear, which means the oil has probably just been changed. So you can discern that very quickly. You can also look into that engine access uh, door and you can look for any obvious damage in the engine compartment. Um, and some of them are on some airplanes are quite a bit wider and you can really get a good look around. I always pop my head in and just look around. You can see, you can see the cables that lead to the spark plugs. Uh, you can see the engine mounts often. Um, you can see if there's any oil that's been sprayed around inside the engine. So you can discern quite a few things just by looking inside there. Once everything is fine there, then you close the port again and move to the nose of the airplane. At that point, what I usually do is I literally run my hands along the propeller, feeling for any sharp burrs or, uh, or indentations from perhaps rock strikes of the propeller. And while visually inspecting for any cracks that might be forming in the propeller, which could be very catastrophic if a, if a prop strike with a rock, like say on a gravel runway, had chipped out a part of the propeller, especially toward the end of the propeller, and it had gone unnoticed and a crack started to develop, it's possible that the end of the propeller could fly off, could uh, fling off in flight, which would create a very unbalanced state and uh, potential deadly engine failure. So inspect the propeller, both blades, and then you have the cowl ports and the front cowl ports. You want to look to see on either side that lets the air in to cool the engine, that there's no bird nests in there, no animals have burrowed into there, that there's no uh, blockages of other sorts that might be in there. So you can have a look at that. Move down under the nose cone, inspect the nose cone, make sure it's on nice and tight, that all the screws are attached to it and you will have the air vent. The air vent, the air, you're gonna see the air filter, which is foam-like substance, all right? Make sure that that's not blocked, that it's not all eaten and worn away, perhaps, and so that dirty air is getting into the, into the engine. Uh, that's not good, so just make sure that the air vent is in good condition. And then go lower, and now you're gonna see the nose wheel, okay, and you're gonna see the pulley arms, from the foot steering, for the rudder foot pedal steering, and you'll be able to see the nuts and bolts that are attached to that. You're gonna be able to see the state of, uh, of the oleo, how inflated is the oleo. Um, you can grab the inner side of the propeller and pull down and lift up and see if the oleo compresses and then extends back to its normal position. Or perhaps the oleo has, uh, has, has had a leak and you see absolutely none of the, of the of the shiny metal tube that's the inside, uh, that's the strut, right? If you don't see the shiny metal tube, right, that means that your oleo is probably, is probably empty and that uh, the airplane will just clunk along as it goes over bumps. It's not good for the airplane. So you wanna see that the oleo is inflated properly. And of course, you're gonna have the two, actu uh, the two control arms that steer, that steer the, uh, the nose wheel. Wanna make sure that they're secured properly and the little lock wires are in there, or the tiny cotter pins are, are in there. 
Um, and then you want to just have a look and make sure that the tire is in good condition, just like you did the left and right main tires. Very important. And, uh, and that all the pieces of the, of the nose wheel assembly are obviously there. All right. So you just want to have a good look at that. I mean, I, I know that there have been, I think there was one incident where a good chunk of the uh, nose wheel assembly was actually missing or not put back properly or had fallen off in flight and nobody didn't notice it for several flights at a flight school I was at. Um, also, uh, with some of the airplanes, you're going to be able to see these two poles that go from the nose wheel assembly up into the engine compartment, like the Cessna 152s, the 150s. Well, these are actually engine mounts. And uh, sometimes these suffer damage and are re-welded. So you want to make sure that there's no cracks and that, there's, there's, that they're properly welded to the nose gear assembly. Now, some of the Cessna 172 models, you're not going to be able to see that. Um, they're more hidden in, in the uh, nose cowling, so you're not going to see that. But with the 152s, you can check the conditions of those. So that's basically the walk around um, complete. At that point, I back away from the airplane again, usually while my student is in and starting the pre-flight checklist or just about to or buckling in, and I'll just do another big walk around the airplane. And what does the instructor look for primarily? Are the fuel caps on? Super important. Have the chocks been removed? There's nothing more embarrassing than trying to taxi out and the, and the chalk is still on one of the wheels. So is, here's a big one. Is the, uh, is, is the uh, what do you call it? Uh, forget what you call it. The thing that you, you attach to the nose wheel to pull the airplane. Is it sitting still attached to the nose wheel of the airplane? Well, the tow bar. Well, obviously that's going to cause problems. Um, people have been known to take off with tow bars still attached to the nose wheel. Super embarrassing as well as uh, potentially dangerous. So I just do that big walk around and I'm looking to see that those fuel caps are on, that the chocks are out, that the, uh, that the tow bar is not still attached <laughs> to the airplane. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. And then you're ready to go flying. So um, by all means, um, go ahead and then take a look at your POH and Perhaps you can find a different method, but it doesn't really matter where you start and where you're in. It's whether or not you do a complete inspection or not. And not, not just complete, but detailed. You know, I always say to my students, like nuts and bolts hold the airplane together. So why wouldn't you check the nuts and bolts? So especially, you know, on all of the movable surfaces. All right. So uh, that's my little chat about the walk around today trying to make a few more videos here in Berlin before I go back to Canada, whenever the isolation period ends. And uh, yeah, that's it. So I hope you have a great day and enjoy my videos and I'll see you again soon. Goodbye.